I want to thank you all very much for joining me. And I feel very strongly that I do need to begin with the mission. We are in fact a mission driven school. All of you, you can read what the mission is. To me, it's really all about identifying and solving the world's biggest and most complex problems in order to make the world a better place. And if you're not familiar with MIT, as well as MIT Sloan, you'll know that this is actually really the, the, the mission and the drive for the greater institute for MIT, as well as for MIT Sloan. And so it works really, really well. Um, we here at Sloan have what we call a portfolio of programs. So a little story, if I might. When our current Dean, Dean Dave Schmidtlein joined us back in 2007, he was charged with increasing the footprint of the Sloan community. At that point in time, we had our two-year MBA program. We had our LGO program, Leaders for Global Operations. And those two programs combined are roughly around 410 students. And we had our Sloan Fellows Executive MBA program, which at the time was, I'll say, around 100. Don't quote me on that, but today it's 113. I'm going to say it's around 100. The easiest thing for him to do, for the school to do at that time, would have been to increase the size of the MBA program, of the two-year program. The demand was there. That would have been the easiest thing to do. He chose not to because he believes very strongly that the size of the program, that 410 when you combine the two, that 360 when it's just MBA, that's part of the characteristic character of the program. And he believed then and he believes today it's of human scale the opportunity to really get to meet and know many, if not all of your classmates in a very comfortable way to meet the people in the class ahead of you and in the class behind you. And so when charged with this order, when charged with this um, mandate to increase the, pro the profile, what he did instead was create this portfolio. We created a master of finance program right around the financial crisis of 2008, 2009. The MFIN um, mission is about creating the next generation of principled financial leaders. We created an executive MBA program, 20 month part time. You, um, these are people who have on average 17 years of work experience. We then a few years later created a master's in business analytics. Everything we do today, data driven, is it not? And so why not create a program where you're really training people in all of this? Now, you might be saying, why is she telling me this? I came here today to hear about MBA or maybe even hopefully LGO. And so why should I care? You should care for many reasons, but the most tactical one is because the format of our program is in fact, you take a core set of classes. We have a one semester core, and then you as an MBA student have three semesters to really shape your curriculum. Once you start taking electives, you're sitting in class, you're part of project teams with people from these other programs. In fact, you could be in, pro in classes and on projects with people not from just other programs, but from other parts of MIT. This integrated approach is very intentional. It did not happen by accident. Again, go back to the mission. In order to really be best prepared to truly solve the world's biggest and most complex problems, you need people to come together with different backgrounds, different experience levels, different strengths. And that's exactly what we're trying to replicate in a Sloan classroom. Now we also have, as you can see, several dual degree programs. We have one with MIT's Department of Urban Studies and Planning. We also have one with the Harvard Kennedy School. Uh, for the Harvard Kennedy School, I'm gonna say it now and I'm probably gonna say it again later on. If you're interested in potentially pursuing an MBA and a master's from the Kennedy School. These are two two-year programs where you basically shave a semester off of each. So you do the three, you do the four years in three. Starting this coming year, you need to apply to both simultaneously. Um, apply to both, get in, and then we'll talk about the sequencing. Um, so that's something slightly different than in past years. The demand has really increased. We have a ceiling on the number of people who we actually um, allowed to do this every year. And so if this is something that interests you, I strongly encourage you to apply to both this coming year. We also have, and this could be new to the three of you, we have seven certificates. 
we have a, we're simplifying things. If you all have been hanging around for a while and you said, wait a minute, I thought MIT Sloan had tracks and certificates. We are now trying to simplify and those three tracks and four certificates that you're so familiar with have now become seven certificates. So we have a certificate in finance, a certificate in entrepreneurship and innovation, a certificate in enterprise management, sustainability, healthcare, data analytics, uh, and the newest one is in digital product management. You can think of these as roadmaps. You can think of these as concentrations. Again, one semester core and three semesters to really shape the curriculum as you see fit and as you what your needs are. And if you happen to have an interest or a passion in any one of these areas, here's a little bit of a kickstart for you in terms of classes to take and a community to become a part of. I wanna talk a little bit more about LGO. Anybody in the room interested in LGO? Great. Well, others may be as well. So if you have a STEM degree, if you have a passion for creating, if you wanna stay in the forefront of technology, and if you want to lead teams, I'm just reading this. I usually don't do that, but someone else, I'm reading someone else's slide to solve challenging technical problems you should seriously consider LGO. Um, one of our panelists, Leah, is actually um, LGO, and so she'll be talking more about her experience. If you're wondering to yourself, hmm, what's the difference between like, how do I think about LGO versus MBA? Here's a little something to help you out. So LGO is two full years. It actually starts in June and then goes through two years in the spring. At the end, you receive two degrees a master's in engineering in one of our engineering disciplines, as well as an MBA. The MBA program, you receive one degree. LGO has some very generous fellowship and funding, especially it's in support of the internships that you need to do. Um, whereas with the MBA, that's somewhere between your first and second year, you will most likely be doing a paid internship. And LGO ends up, as I described, being 24 months, MBA is 21. MBA has a one semester core, LGO is a bit of a more um, structured curriculum, including a master's thesis. Your LGO community, which is around 50, the class that just started is actually 50, uh, the class that just started is 53. Um, very, very tight knit community. The MBA program, a little bit more global, somewhere between 50 and 60 countries represented. Again, those of you interested in LGO, you're going to hear a lot more about it this evening. And we'll share with you other ways to get in even more exposure. Now, I've done a little bit of sort of setting the, the, um, the, uh, your expectations. I'm going to ask our panelists to come and join me. And we, by their experiences, come on, by their experiences, we're going to walk through a little bit more around curriculum, community, and career. And then we will leave to, oh, I'm going to talk a little bit about admissions. Anybody, anybody really? curious at all about admissions. <laughs> That's why I'm here. Um, and then we will leave some time to take questions, both from people in the room, as well as from people who might be on the live stream. If you have questions, please submit them. All right. So what happened to my panelists? Slide? Meet the panelists. <laughs> oh, we're going to have to meet you guys without the slide. All right. If you wouldn't mind, and I so apologize. It's probably further down. Please introduce yourselves. Let um, them know what program, um, what year you are, and what you did before coming to Slum. Okay, I'll start. Um, Donna introduced me as the LGO. So I am I'm Leah. Um, I am in LGO. I am a 24, which means I am exactly midway through my LGO MBA journey. Um, before coming to MIT, I was an R&D engineer in the medical device industry. Good evening, beautiful souls. Uh, my name is Stuart Pena. Uh, I am a recent alumni as of last month of Sloan, uh, and it's a little bit sad because I really love the experience, but that's why I'm still here. Uh, and before Sloan, uh, I was a chemical engineer in the energy industry. Hi, everyone. My name is Lily Wandusen. I'm also MBA class of 2024. Uh, before business school, I was working at Pfizer doing global health and social impact. Um, as you can imagine, it was hectic during COVID, so quite the experience. 
Okay, thank you all very much. So one of the things that I have talked about already several times is the flexible curriculum. What I would love for each of you to do is to share a little bit about what your objectives were for coming to Sloan and how you either shaped your curriculum throughout your time or since you've been here so far, how you've really shaped your curriculum. And let's go the other way. Lily, why don't you start? Oh, great, thank you. Um, I think for me, one of the most important things coming to Sloan was really taking advantage of the fact that Sloan has this like symbiotic relationship between thinking and doing. And Donna mentioned this, it's in our mission. It's, it's a mission driven institution. So I really want to take advantage of the fact that not only is it an elite institution, but we really get the chance to apply all the things that we've learned through action learning labs by doing study tours. And so last semester during my spring break, I had the chance to go to um, Vietnam and Japan as part of my study tour. And the vision for study tours at Sloan is that you get the chance to plan it. That's the most fun part. Um, and then actually go to these different countries and apply the theme that you're interested in. And so for me, I'm really interested in supply chain operations. So the program was called China Plus One. So how do we think about other countries becoming the other uh, places where we can really rely on supply chain operations? So we had the chance to visit Unilever, Estee Lauder operation systems in both uh, China and Vietnam. So that's really what I love about Sloan and what I looked forward to when I came here. So when I came to Sloan, my mindset was to start a company in the climate tech world. Coming from energy, I wanted to pivot into renewable energy or clean tech, and I wanted to pursue the entrepreneurship path. That being said, I had no idea how starting a company looked like. I kept saying it, but I had no idea how to do it. So with that, I embarked on that entrepreneurship certificate uh, in order to give me that introduction as to how to be an entrepreneur. And basically after that, all my classes uh, were focused on me developing the entrepreneurship skill, the expertise in energy, and adding a little bit of technical skills with the business analytics certificate as well. So throughout my time at Sloan, I was able to do two certificates uh, of entrepreneurship and business analytics, and I was able to take the classes that has currently led me to my current uh, gig, I guess, uh, where I'm starting full time my own company, because I was able to take all those different classes. And thus I met my co founder through one of those classes. Donna mentioned earlier, how you meet so many different individuals from other classes, my co founder is a postdoc from the chemical engineering department. Um, so not a Sloan at all. And I would not have met him if I'm not taking advantage of those classes where the entire community is integrated. Um, besides that, I also wanted to have a well rounded experience. Uh, so I told myself that I could not be I couldn't have graduated from MIT and not have taken an engineering class. So I embarked on an engineering class and oh boy, did I get what I asked for. <laughs> a little difficult to say the least. Uh, perhaps you all geos. <laughs> uh, so I took an engineering class as well to like add a little bit more to that technical expertise. And then I just wanted to be a well-rounded individual. So I took Japanese uh, my the first semester of my second year uh, and ended up going to Japan uh, during spring break as well. And, and let me tell you, the Japanese came in really handy. Uh, but with that, I'm actually really well prepared now uh, for the challenge that I'm embarking on right now, um, just because I went through basically all the scenarios that I am literally facing on a daily basis as an entrepreneur. Wow. Um, so I have a similar story, but with a little more engineering flavor. So um, MIT is one of the best places to do a dual degree. And though LGO is kind of a baked in ability to meet two goals, it is still very flexible. Um, so I came back to school with a two pronged goal, which is why I'm at a dual degree program. Um, I wanted to transition technically more to the data side um, of the healthcare world. And I wanted to build skills in management and leadership. Um, so I kind of have an open pass to all of what Sloan has to offer, but also all of what the engineering school and specifically the Department of en um, Electrical Engineering and Computer Science has. So I like walk between those two worlds every day. I love that they're totally integrated. Um, and I think it benefits both schools. Um, like Stuart took a class in engineering. Um, I love that someone on my core team is one of the dual degree students at the Kennedy School. So if I really want to take a public policy class at the Kennedy School, I can, and she can tell me which one I should take. Um, so, and, you know, I've had executive MBA students in my classes as well as 
Um, people in finance, I actually never thought I would take a finance class. And then I showed up and one of my favorite classes has been corporate finance. So I love that the program is intended to be flexible and you kind of find your own way and build your own journey as you go. Um, so all of these things apply. I've also taken an action learning class. Um, I was in ops lab, which put me with a group from the Boston Medical Center here working on some of their clinical operations. Um, so I feel like I'm kind of just doing everything all at once and have crazy amounts of access. So we've talked a lot about flexibility from, a curricul from uh, your flexibility in terms of creating your curriculum. And I think it's also worth noting that our faculty have tremendous flexibility in terms of how they teach. So you will take a mix of classes. Some of them will be traditional lectures with problem sets with maybe a case sprinkled in here or there. You will take many project classes. And then we have this category of project classes that some of them already mentioned, which are our action learning lab classes, where the focus of these classes is in fact working on solving or helping solve a real problem for a real company. These labs are either geographically focused or subject focused. So from a geography standpoint, we have China Lab, ASEAN Lab, Israel Lab, USA Lab. And from a subject matter ex, um, perspective, we have, I mean, this won't surprise you, we have a finance lab, we have an entrepreneurship lab, oh, we have a sustainability lab, a healthcare lab. So yes, they many of them align with the certificates, but we also have many others. I think at this moment in time, all the labs across all of the different Sloan programs there's about 19 of them. Um, and our students, while they're not a requirement to complete your degree, and they may be a requirement for completing one of the certificates, our students love the format um, and therefore are eager to take multiple. Can any of you share a little bit about Action Learning Lab classes? So the Action Lab that I took, surprise, was in, uh, Entrepreneurship Lab. Uh, so through this lab, I got the opportunity to work with a startup pre they're like more seed stage, but they hadn't raised a seed round just yet. And they asked me and my teammate, my partner, to come up with the business plans as to how they can break into this market and which market should they select between different ones. So it was basically, you know, business development for a technical team. They didn't have any business people. So we were like the, the business brains of the team for that semester. And we worked together uh, uh, throughout that semester and came up with business recommendations as to where they should go forward. The next day, uh, the, the CTO literally emailed us and say, Stuart, Stephanie, we have decided to pivot our technical development based on your business recommendations, which to me was like, are you, are you sure you're listening to a first year MBA student? Like, I barely know what I'm doing. <laughs> um, and it was a really impactful experience because I got to see what it is like to be firsthand developing the business plan for a startup. Uh, and a few months later, they were actually accepted into the Breakthrough Energy Fellowship, Fellowship Program, which for everyone who knows in climate tech world, is actually a $1.5 million grant that they get to develop their company with non-equity included. And it was a phenomenal experience to see myself actually providing that impact and being basically firsthand getting my hands dirty, especially because a year later, as I was starting my own company in climate tech, I knew what step exactly to take. And I was very fortunate that a year later, I was accepted into the Breakthrough Energy Fellows Program, which is kind of crazy because I don't think that would have happened if I didn't get the opportunity to have worked firsthand with that startup and seeing their process. So yes, you're basically working for that company, but you're getting that experience and the investment is infinite. Any other action learning stories? Not action learning stories. Uh, I'll be taking my G Lab next semester, which I'm really excited about. Um, but I would say to your point, Donna, about um, you know working on cases like it's not just through action uh, learning labs. The cases that you actually get to work on, for example, I took a social impact investing class with Professor Gita Rao. If you get a chance to take it, I absolutely recommend it. Um, and we had a chance to work with. We were talking earlier with this company called Atacama Biomet. Uh, materials. And it's a startup that came out of the MIT eco ecosystem. So we were essentially working with this PhD student coming up with a plan for a marketing strategy for their sustainable packaging for a healthcare company. And through this, you're getting to a chance to interview real life entrepreneurs who are raising millions of dollars, and they're trusting you to come up with a pricing strategy, a marketing strategy. And it's not a joke. They actually input all of those recommendations into their marketing materials, which is insane. Um, 
but it puts a lot of pressure on you to really perform well, but also allows you to learn a lot more quicker in a very high intense environment. So if you don't get a chance to participate in action learning environments, the cases and the classes you actually get to take at Sloan will allow you to come out of your comfort zone and actually work with real life company companies um, that only are not in the Boston ecosystem, but are from MIT PhD students. And so you get to network across the entire MIT ecosystem as well. So Lily, you mentioned one faculty member, Guido Rao. Um, I think that's a nice segue into my next first comment and then question, which is, you know, we have amazing faculty and I have no doubt that you attend a lot of info sessions and you hear everybody who stands in my shoes tell you just that. Um, our faculty are all really at the cutting edge of whatever their particular discipline is. Beyond that though, they are here because they want to engage with our students. And we see that in many, many ways. It is not uncommon at all to walk through the cafeteria, which is just downstairs, and to see a faculty member either in the coffee line with a bunch of students or sitting at a table. Um, in fact, I attended an orientation with our dean just last week for another program, and he ended his welcome by saying, I look forward to seeing you in the coffee line. Um, we have faculty who go out of their way for our students, and these relationships don't just you know, aren't just for the two years that you're here. We've had many alum, alums share the stories about, you know, five, 10 years out, they had a problem at work and they thought, oh, what would professor so-and-so do? And when they reach out, not only do they get a response, but a real willingness to connect and help out. I don't want to pick on any of our faculty because they're all amazing, but do any of you have a faculty story or two that you want to share? And again, this is how we could get to six hours. <laughs> I know, I'm trying to pick one. They are all amazing. I will shout out Sean Willems because that's a very LGO answer and I want to leave Sloan for you guys, but um, Sean uh, teaches intro to ops for LGO every summer and he just is a personality. He sets up meetings with everyone. He meets everyone, he knows everyone. By the end of the year or summer, everyone, always dresses up as him like every class does that it's a fun thing it honors him he likes to wear a similar outfit every day um, and he has some Seanisms that get handed down and spoken in LGO chats literally over and over again so he is uh, revered and loved and super accessible to Donna's point um, I also don't want to favor, but I have to give a shout out to Professor Arthi, who's our communications professor from our core semester. One of the kindest, just humble, amazing individuals goes beyond the classroom to support you at any endeavor. Um, she, I needed help with recruiting, casing, with interview prep. She was doing that during her winter vacation when she has a family. So the professors are not just within the academia sphere but they really step out of their you know their day-to-day -to, -day to support you in recruiting life anything um i would also have to shout out professor rama from our data decision and model class one of the hardest class i've ever taken in my entire existence uh if you love linear regression are all of that that's your go-to he's your guy um but he knew i did not like that class but he told me it doesn't matter if you enjoy it come to class every day and i really appreciate someone who doesn't just value the grade that they're going to give you but invest in you because they actually care about the the course so i would have to give, give a shout out to him I'm glad you brought up Arthi because I was going to bring her up if you didn't. Uh, she's someone that I've had literally two hour one on ones with her. Like I booked a 30 minutes with her and she didn't have other meetings and we just kept going, just talking about life, wasn't even advice, was we were just chatting. I see her at this point, especially now that I've graduated, I see her as a friend. Like that's how amazing she is as a human, uh, human being. But the other professor that I want to give a shout out to is Professor Don Sol. Uh, for any of you that end up attending Sloan and end up taking strategy, uh, he's a professor that teaches strategy. And I think he's one of the individuals that single-handedly changed my perspective on business and how to operate in the real world. Um, in the sense that there's a quote that I will never forget that strategy without data is just poetry. And that's something that I, at first I didn't believe. I kind of just laughed. And by the end of the class, I was the one reciting it back. <laughs> and he never said it again. It was just the way he taught the course. He like went too far to validate that. I took his class. I TA for him. I went biking with him at Cape Cod as well. And he left me in the dust. <laughs> um, but also, uh, he's just someone that I know that I will be reaching out to in the future just as a coach, just as an advice. 
Uh, he's one of the people that we invited as a last speaker. Uh, before you graduate, you get to invite three professors to give one last lecture to you guys. And it's just more advices as you embark to the real world. He and Professor Arthi were two out of the three. Uh, and I, to this day, will never forget their advices. I know it's only been two months, but I will remember it for a long time. Okay, we're gonna actually shift outside of the classroom because believe it or not, your MBA experience is not just about academics. Um, and so I wanna move outside of the classroom and talk a little bit about the community. Within Sloan, we have somewhere between 70 and 80 different clubs. And that number varies because it's very much driven by student interest. And so it fluctuates year over year. There's great opportunities within our clubs to take on leadership positions, uh, to really help you further develop your leadership skills, to familiarize yourself perhaps with particular areas that you've always been curious about, to meet industry experts in particular areas. Our clubs go from the purest of social so that example is what's called the Happy Belly Club. And it, it's just that for people who love to experiment with new food, um, students from all of our different programs get together on a regular basis. They cook, they go out to restaurants and really enjoy exploring the greater Boston area. We have professional clubs. So there's a consulting club, there's a VCPE club, there's an investment club. Um, we have sports clubs, we have affinity clubs, uh, you name it. And, you know, one of the questions that at least I often get in an interview is how many clubs should I join? Which if you have an interview, don't ask that question. Um, the answer of course is it depends. Um, but what I'd be really curious about is if any of you could just, actually all three of you could talk a little bit about how you spend your time outside of the classroom before we get to careers. So it's there's, if you think about it, for those of you who have the, a bit of a, you know, a math background, think of it like a Venn diagram where you have an academic circle, you have a community outside of the classroom circle, and you have a career circle. And they overlap. And there are, in fact, times when you're doing something that is perhaps something that's related to both a class and something that you're doing for a club, and yet it's going to help you from a career standpoint too in interviews. It's really interesting. All right, I'll be quiet. Let's start with... Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yep. Um, well, I've learned a ton about wine since being at MIT. I that <laughs> so uh, shout out for the wine club. Um, <laughs> um, I'm also obviously no surprise in the healthcare club. Um, I've done and learned a lot about a lot of new sports. I've learned how to sail on the Charles River and have been doing that some more. Um, I also was a rower previously and um, was briefly rowing here as well, early in the mornings <laughs> sometimes. Um, so it's been a really good mix of things. Um, I did, I'm sure you'll talk about ski club, so I won't take any of your thunder there, but um, have been on trips. I've been to both the Middle East and South America with my classmates. Um, and yeah, I feel like I have a really good mix all the time of lots of different types of people and lots of different types of things to learn outside the classroom. I love it. Um, I think I did 15 plus clubs while I was a Sloan. Um, so I was the president of the ski and snowboarding club where we organized the largest trip that happens within Sloan, where this last year we took 450 people to Steamboat, Colorado for an entire week full of amazing experiences, both on the mountain and off the mountain, because we wanted to make sure we were inclusive to non-skiers as well. So we had duck sledding, we had ice fishing, snowmobiling on top of all the skiing and the snowboarding. We also rented a top of the gondola. Uh, this is me advertising the club. I am not leading anymore, but I want it to still be the most popular club out of all of them because I had such a phenomenal experience. Anyone who attends, you guys will come back to me and say, you were right. Um, but I was also involved in many other clubs. Uh, I was the president of the Shakers Club where we performed dances. We performed one this past year yeah. together. Um, I was also, uh, let me see, I was the... Uh, I was <laughs> director of the MIT Energy and Climate Club. I was the president of the skydiving club. I was in the cheerleading team, went to Daytona Beach, part of the MIT Hispanic Club. Uh, I did not do happy bellies, but I did show up to the events. I helped out with Sloan Follies. Um, I'm, I'm thinking I'm blanking out on two or three other sports out there. But basically, I embarked on every single activity. I was heavily involved as the leader in all of them. So hopefully, I can be the example that you can do it. 
Now, the question you might ask is, did I sleep? And it's like, do you think I need sleep? <laughs> um, it's up to you. you. It's up to you to decide what you want to embark on. It depends. I just had the energy and excitement to embark on all those different activities. And I am so glad I did because I have literally no regrets. Um, you're amazing. <laughs> um, I will first off say FOMO is real in business school. FOMO is real. But then first year ends and JOMO will start creeping in. That's joy of missing out. And that's because there's literally so many things to do within this four walls at MIT that it can be overwhelming. And sometimes you may not need to go to that party or that club meeting or that conference, but the beauty of it is that it does exist and allows you to expand your horizons and try different things. Fantastic. Um, for me, I think what I really wanted to hone on is joining the Africa Business Club. And next year, I'm going to be the co-president of the Africa Business Club. So if you do come, please join. Um, the mission of our club is really to uplift and exemplify the excellence of Africa and the continent. You don't have to be African to join. It's really supporting all the uh, amazing organizations that are coming out of the continent, all the people that are within MIT that are interested in impacting the continent. And so our... Our premier uh, event out of ABC is called the AIC, which is Africa Innovate Conference. It happens every year in April. Um, it's a two-day conference. It's an opportunity for us to bring amazing panelists from, again, back home, but also within the U.S. that talk about VC, finance, healthcare, um, entrepreneurship, mobility, whatever you have it. And then we have a performance that happens by uh, typically by an African artist. So it's really an opportunity for you to network and uh, figure out whether or not you want to work on, on the continent. And that just goes beyond ABC. We have an organization called MISTI, which typically supports in students that are interested in working in emerging and um, last mile population countries. So that's also another organization that you can consider. Um, I'm also part of the BBSA, which is the Black Business Student Association at MIT. Um, those two typically go hand in hand, but they are siloed organization. Um, our mission is to always make sure that DNI is at the forefront of MIT. Um, and we work a lot with admissions to make sure that is embedded in the fabric of this institution because it is important and it will always be important. Um, so yeah, that's something that I'm really passionate about and I look forward to working on that next year. Um, and I said it better myself. Thank you. Thank you all so very much. Um, so outside of the community, we're going to talk a little bit about careers. Um, you know, we understand that one of your main drivers for coming to business school is, in fact, to help advance your career. Um, and we have a career development office that is really dedicated to help you develop the skills, the expertise, the tools and the confidence that you need to be successful in that summer internship job search, that first job search out of school, and that fifth job search out of school. They are not a job placement organization. They require admissions to say that anytime we're out in public. Um, but I think it's also really important because they, they are not. They're really about helping you develop the skills and expertise. What they have become very aware of over the last, um, you know, over the last while is the fact that we have students with incredibly diverse backgrounds and interests wanting to go and do very diverse things. And so we do have people who are interested um, in going to work in consulting. We have people who are going interested in going into work into investment banking. We also have many people who are interested in going to work in fintech or impact investing um, to do product management for large and small companies, to go work at the intersection of your greatest passion in technology. And so they work very hard to help you develop those skills and then to open doors for you to be able to navigate whatever that path might be for yourself. And one of the best ways to do that is to really fully engage with our alums who have all right before you, um, or maybe even you know longer than that, have also um, you know paved their way to be successful in many, 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 many different careers. I'm wondering if any of you had any interactions with the career office um, that you might want to share with the group. Mm -hmm. We talked about this, so they're looking at me. Um, I, when I was recruiting, I really took advantage of the career office it's called CDO uh, for sure. And the main purpose of CDO is to really be 
uh, a net for you when you're in the recruiting process. It doesn't even have to be career oriented. If you just want to go in there, hop in, do a quick resume check. They're usually, they have office hours. They're sitting outside, just walking through a resume with you. Or if you want to do a 20 minute interview prep before you have your coffee chat with a, a recruiter that's on campus, it's really a catch all place for you to take advantage of when you're coming into this place. Um, I encourage you to develop a relationship with the CDO ambassador counselor to make sure that they know what you're looking for when you're coming here so they can really um, delegate opportunities or figure out how they want to um, source different resources for you that's on campus or outside of campus. Um, as for me, I had a really good relationship with a CDO um, woman by the name of Chris. She's amazing. Um, if you get a chance to meet with her, I encourage you to have a 15 minute coffee chat with her. Um, typically when I was recruiting, I would check in maybe once or twice a week, depending on her schedule. Those schedules fill up really quickly, usually go online and you place in a 20 minute or 30 minute coffee chat. You could do a virtual or you could do it in person. They're located upstairs. Um, but yeah, I had a really amazing experience with CDO. Um, and that's because I took advantage of the resources, not only within the employees at MIT, but as Donna mentioned, the alumni ecosystem at Sloan, once you have that MIT EDU email, it's set, you're set. Like just send out that email and someone will respond to you guaranteed. Um, and so that's the opportunity and um, amazing experience that I had at CDO. Um, with entrepreneurship, uh, it's a bit more difficult to take advantage of those resources. Uh, I definitely talked to them when it came to reviewing my resume, when I was thinking about applying to other startups. But let's be honest, even applying to startups, they just wanted to get to know you. They don't really care about the resume. You tell them you did this and they believe you. <laughs> um, so I didn't take as much advantage of those resources available. So that's something to keep in mind that as an entrepreneur, they are available, but generally the routes, you're creating your own paths. It's a little more difficult to take advantage of those resources. I would, can I just add something, Donna? I would say, so at Sloan, we have these things called, these three pathways to recruiting. Um, and they're very famous. Um, the first one is called the highway road. The second is called the dirt path, the dirt path. And then the third is the jungle. So the, the highway is basically for those people that are recruiting consulting, IB, very structured recruiting. People come on campus, have coffee chats with you. You know when the deadline is happening. So typically recruiting happens early in the fall. I'm think, talking October, November. And then your interview will typically be in January. That's for consulting. IB, it's typically earlier. And then for the dirt road, that's people maybe that are doing um, product management, tech, that the, the deadlines are kind of mushy. You don't know when it's happening. You have to be on the game to reach out to all these people and make sure that you don't pass on the deadline. And then the jungle is for the startups. Uh, it's for those individuals that are seeking opportunities within the startup world where you have to be really aggressive in having those coffee chats, meeting with those people because the deadlines are super amenable. There are people in my class that got startup opportunities in May when we left the campus. I got my summer internship offer June 8th last summer. So you just you just never know, which is why it's called the jungle. Um, so it's figuring out where you wanna land and taking advantage of CDO, but also your classmates and the uh, the alumni that, um, that are available for you. Yeah, I was super impressed when I first met the CDO that they support the jungle and the dirt path um, because I think it's really much easier to support um, the highway route. Um, but I think more and more students are taking the, the more difficult ways. Um, and LGO specifically, the internship is a little bit different. So we don't go through the CDO for the internship year, but I will be meeting with them a lot now that I'm starting to think about full-time recruiting. Um, so your internship is managed with the LGO office. Um, and actually through LGO, I've been in touch with a bunch of alums just to talk, have coffee chats and talk about like the future of my career and my interests. Um, and I have an LGO alum advisor who is just like there to be a friend and help guide me through um, my time at LGO and Sloan and thinking about my career path. So there's like so many people who can help you from the offices to the alumni network. Um, and again, it's worth taking advantage of. Thank you. Um, okay, so we talked a little bit about alums. I want to just share some numbers with you. So as an MIT Sloan student, you actually become both an M in graduate 
you then become an MIT Sloan alum as well as an MIT alum. So MIT Sloan has over 24,000 alums worldwide. MIT has close to 140,000. Um, and you were part of both of these. For people who, you know, here in the States, in many geographies, there'll be a Sloan Alumni Club as well as an MIT club. And as a Sloan alum, you're certainly welcome to participate in both. In many locations around the world, there tends to be one club, the MIT club, and more often than not, it's the Sloan alums who are actually managing it. Um, but nonetheless, we have amazing alumni networks all over the world. Um, interestingly enough, though, if you look um, here at active companies, so MI, this is MIT. Um, there are over 30,000 active companies who can trace their roots back to MIT. Those companies have generated over 4.6 million jobs, with, which have generated over $2 trillion in total annual revenue. If you took the MIT flag and waved it as a nation, um, we would be somewhere between the 10th and 11th largest economy in the world. That's impact for you. So keep that in mind. Okay, now with that, I would love to shift gears a little bit and don't go anywhere. I'm actually going to give them a little homework. I know it's summer, but I'm going to give you a little bit of homework and then you can go stretch your legs, but don't go too far. I want you to think about two things. First and foremost is you weren't in these seats that long ago. So what piece of advice would you give to the people in the room today and who are online around the world, whether about thinking about schools, the application process, really anything. And then I'm going to ask you for one word or phrase. You cannot breathe in the middle. It has to be short. That best describes your MIT Sloan experience to date. Okay? You're welcome to go do what you like. Okay, so with that, I'm gonna shift gears a little bit and I'm gonna talk about the application process. For the people in the room here, how many of you are thinking about applying this year, whether it be to LGO or the MBA, um, matriculating in the fall of 2024? Nice. How many of you, I'm guessing it's the rest, have really just started your journey and you're thinking you're not really sure when? That's great. It is never too soon to attend information sessions like this. I would actually encourage you to number one, come back often. Um, you'll hear different students and alums tell their stories. And number two, I actually encourage you to go out and attend events like this at all the schools you're thinking about. Um, schools have a personality. And while we try to explain it on the website, we try to explain it in our fact sheets and our brochures, sometimes it takes walking in the doors to really feel it. So I encourage you to go out and do that. Now, our application will be released in the next couple of weeks. We're doing some internal testing. Um, fundamentally, from your perspective, it's not going to change much. So if you've been tracking us for a while, if you've been looking at the website, if perhaps you started an application last year, threw out, all, you know, really threw off all of our numbers because we, you know, we watch everything and, you know, 20,000 people started an application, we get so excited and then huh, not so many apply, just kidding. Um, you'll, you'll have a good sense of what it is and I'm going to share with you what the components are. It's not going to be that drastically different. Um, so let me talk about deadlines because we do have our deadlines and they're very similar to previous years. So for LGO, there will be one application deadline this year, one, and it'll be November 8th. For MBA, we will continue to have three. Round one will be September 27th. Round two will be January 17th in 2024. And then the round three application deadline will be April 8th. If you're sitting here today and thinking about, seriously thinking about applying to the MBA, write down the round one number, write down the round two, do not even write down the round three number. I encourage you to apply as early as you can. And it's not because we have quotas that we say we're gonna admit this many people in this round and this and many in this round, it's because we don't. Because the reality is that at any point in time, Throughout the application process, we want to be able to advance those people who are, in fact, the strongest. Um, and that could vary. And so the only thing that I can tell you, and for this is for MBA only, right, we have 360 seats to fill. In round one, 
there are 360 seats. That's actually not technically correct. For those of you who are really in tune, we have maybe some defers from the previous year. We have our early admits, so we don't even have 360 then. However, by the time we get to round two, I guarantee you we have less than we had in round one. And by round three, we have even fewer. In addition, if you apply in round one, you could be admitted. You could also be waitlisted. And if you're waitlisted in a round one, you're actually considered as part of our round two pool, which is different than having a round two, having a bunch of people admitted. And then if, if we happen to have any you know, seats available, then we would actually go to the wait list. Because again, always looking for the strongest that could in fact be round one wait lists who are stronger than some round two people. Very long way of basically saying, apply as early as you can. All right, let me walk through the application components. So we ask you for transcripts from all schools that contributed to you receiving your degree or degrees. We have many people applying for the MBA who actually already have an advanced degree. That's fine, you just wanna see the transcripts. If as an undergrad, you did a semester away, we wanna see those grades as well. So we wanna see transcripts and these don't have to be the official. So if your mom has your college grades on the refrigerator, ask her if you can borrow them. Once you get in and then you're, 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 you're admitted and then we go through verification, we'll then ask for the official ones. We ask for a resume, a professional resume describing your work history, your, your academics. We, we provide you with a bit of a framework there. A cover letter, um, 300 words or less. I'll get back to that in a minute. We ask for an org chart. The org chart that helps describe your current work situation. This is not, this is not the company org chart that you could find on the website. This is, more think about this almost like a relationship map where you stick your face in the middle of a piece of paper and then do you have people reporting to you do you have peers to whom do you report that's really what we're looking for and for people who perhaps work in consulting who you're working on different projects at different times with different structures you know i think what probably makes most sense is your most recent project if however you were working on a project that was 200 people and you had lots of responsibility. And now in the interim, you're working on something that's more of an internal project. Maybe you wanna put that previous project on. I mean, let me say this, and I word it very carefully. We have never not admitted somebody because of their org chart. So we completely appreciate the amount of time people spend on all of the components of the application. And in particular, when talking to somebody about the org chart, it this for whatever reason, it tends to be a very high stress level there. I promise you that is not, every part's important. So I don't wanna say it's not the most important part, but you know, practically speaking, org charts come in many different shapes and sizes. How's that? Okay, a 60 second interview, one minute, introducing yourselves to your future classmates. I promise you, you don't share it with them. So don't worry about that. Have fun with it. This is an opportunity for you to show your personal side. What is it that um, excites you? What is it that gets you up in the morning? What is it that you're passionate about? 60 seconds. This is not professional quality. This is you with your phone or a friend with their phone, really just videotaping you. I encourage you to have fun with it, but not at the cost of perhaps the audio not working well. Stuart, I apologize when I'm about to say this, but... There was a time when we had a bunch of people who loved to ski and they actually chose to do their video on the slopes, either on the ride up or actually on the top of a ski slope. I kid you not. And so beautiful scenery, beautiful, but we couldn't hear anything they were hearing because there was so much noise around them. And so it's sort of a missed opportunity. So I encourage you to get creative, but not at the cost of the audio. Now, the cover letter, the resume, and the video, think of those three together to really tell your story. Your resume is a bit about your professional experience. Your video is your personal side. And then the cover letter ties it all together and begins to tell us why MIT slow, all in 300 words or less. 
We know that you can't possibly tell us everything. And the written application is not the whole story, but we want it, you want it to be enough that we want to hear more. We ask for one letter of recommendation, only one, so make it a good one. I would actually encourage you to think about your recommender as one of the first things you do when you seriously sit down and say, I'm going to apply to Sloan or any other school for that matter. Identify people who know you well, who are invested in your success, who are willing to take the time to write a meaningful and thoughtful and detailed letter of recommendation. We don't care about their title. We are not assessing them. They are evaluating you. So if you happen to bump into the CEO of your company in an elevator one day and think, oh, now I can turn around and ask her for a letter of recommendation, well, what are they going to say? You have nice elevator etiquette? <laughs> Missed opportunity. My jokes are falling short here. Thank you, Stuart. <laughs> really, I think everybody's just tired. It's been a long day and it's hot out. Because these usually kill and they are flat tonight. It's not like I, this is my first time doing this, in case you couldn't tell. So think about that. The one thing I will advise you, though, on is if somebody says to you, you know what, I would love to write a recommendation, to submit a recommendation for you, but I am so busy. Would you mind writing it? And I'll take a look at it and sign it. Use us as the bad guys and say no. Really, you really want them to take the time and to write the letter of recommendation. We ask for two additional references, names and contact information, in case we're you know, headed down a path and we have a few outstanding questions and we might wanna just reach out to somebody. We would never cold call them. We would send them an email and ask to set up a time to talk, but you should let them know that you're you know, providing their information to us. We ask you, we, have, we introduced this last year, an optional short answer question where you have the opportunity to share with us anything else about your life story that you want us to know that helps explain who you are today and how you got there. Um, this is not the place to tell us why you had bad grades in undergrad your first year. This is more really about you and your personal background, your family history, um, and then GMAT or GRE. Uh, we do not care, and um, it has to have been valid in the last five years. I'm guessing many of you know GMAT is about to cut over to a new type of exam, a new exam. We will accept either. We will accept GMAT, the new GMAT, I think it's GMAT Focus, is that what it's called? Yeah. Um, or GRE. We, we do not care. All applications are reviewed. A subset of individuals are invited for an interview. An interview is a required next step in the process. Um, they will continue to be virtual this year. Before the pandemic, they were in person. Since the pandemic, we've actually gotten very comfortable and familiar with the virtual. And to be honest, there's lots of benefits to you all really in, in, um, for us to make them virtual. And so we're gonna keep them virtual this year. They're about 30 minutes. If your interview is 28 minutes, please don't go on Reddit and complain. <laughs> See, that's one. I've read those complaints too. It, 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 it means nothing. It really absolutely means nothing. Um, the 40 minute interview could be that your interviewer like lost track because it was such a boring conversation. So don't think that that's necessarily a great sign. Don't go to Reddit. Whew, my conversation was 40 minutes. They must have loved me. You can't tell. If in fact you're invited for an interview, we are going to ask you to submit two additional pieces of information for us within 24 hours prior to the interview. One of them is um, a question around a time when you've actually contributed to creating a diverse environment. And then the second is we're going to ask you for a data visualization. One page, something that either you've created or something that you have seen that has really left an impression on you and we ask you to write a little bit about it. This is my favorite part of the application. And in fact, for myself and many of the interviewers, I will use this as an icebreaker in the interview and ask you to explain it to me and tell me why it's important. The data visualizations run the gamut. There are some very social ones. There've been a few over the years. I'm um, sanitizing this a little bit um, of like game show strategies. 
And then there's been climate change. And of course there was a lot during COVID around COVID and income inequality and anything and everything you could imagine. It's actually another opportunity for you to share what's important to you and what you're passionate about. That's it. Um, after we interview, we have our admissions committee. And again, we either will admit you, reject you, or waitlist you. That's the application process. It's very straightforward. Let me say one more thing. Um, and then are you guys are you almost ready? Okay. I want to say one more thing about the application. Fundamentally, there are no right or wrong answers. They aren't. We have designed our whole application as an opportunity for you to share with us more about yourself and over the course of the process for you to get to know more about us and for us to get to know more about you. There are no canned answers that we are looking for. And in fact, if you try to give us an answer that you think we want that isn't really about you, you're gonna end up at a school that isn't right for you. And then what happens? Be honest, be yourselves. That's all we really are asking for. All right, with that, come on back. All right, the first question was a piece of advice. What piece of advice would each of you give to this audience today as you're thinking about pursuing an MBA or an LGO degree? <laughs> um, my advice is to talk to as many people as you can find um, in your life, um, mentors, people who you don't know but would be willing to talk to you, um, particularly people who've been at similar decision points as you um, in their life and hopefully people who have made different decisions. You know, so people who went to get an MBA and people who decided not to go get an MBA. That was the most helpful piece for me, just hearing a lot of people's backgrounds and kind of chatting it out with different types of people. Um, and then are we saving the word for yeah, later? Yeah, yeah. We'll okay, that afterwards. all right, that's my advice. My advice is to be your unapologetic self. Mm -hmm. Don't be, don't apologize for who you are. Uh, the best example I can give you is that when I submitted my video, I did think about doing it in slow, but I didn't. Uh, what I did is I did it in front of a skydiving plane uh, right before I went on a skydive uh, because I wanted to be my true authentic. The audio was good. Don't worry about that. <laughs> I'm here. <laughs> um, but I, the reason I had such a phenomenal experience was because I was accepted into a school no, knowing that I apply as myself. And that means that they accepted who I was. And I was able to truly be myself here to, to no degree, to like no, no limits. Um, and that's something that I really appreciate it. And that's something that I tell everyone. It's like, yes, you might want to come to MIT Sloan, but I won't say that MIT Sloan is fit for every single type of personality. And it's like, if you are yourself and you are accepted to the school and the school accepts you like vice versa, you're going to have a phenomenal experience. I love that. Um, my is, I knew this, but I wish I knew I took it more seriously is the reality is MBA programs are expensive. I think Sloan is at what, $109,000 per year. Like that's a lot of money to invest in your education. That's not just tuition. That's room board and tuition. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I did not mean to interrupt. No, that. no worries. Um, it's, it's a lot of money to consider and the, you're giving up two years of you know, paychecks to come to this, to any business program. Um, so I would really be aware of your financial situation, um, not just for, to pay for Sloan, but there's so many things that you want to take advantage of when you come to your MBA program. I'm talking about the extensive list of amount of travels you want to do um, from study tours, from your month off during your holiday break, during Christmas, trip. the ski trip. Let me tell you that trip is expensive. So how much is it again? Uh, it was only $1,000, $1,200 per person. Okay. Well, yeah, flight not included. Um, so it's it's a very expensive experience to have. And so I would really be cautious about saving. Um, look at all your options. Apply for scholarships. If it's a loan, really be keen on understanding how you'll finance your MBA program because you don't want to come into this place and be like, holy crap, how am I going to pay for next year? So really understand your financial capabilities, whether that's taking out loan or paying for scholarships or working, the reality is like a lot of us do end up picking up jobs in, in our MBA programs. I'll be TAing for two classes next semester. That's an opportunity for you to offset some of your financial obligations as a student. So um, 
I would really just think about financials before you come to business school. Good advice, all of you. All right, one word or phrase that best describes your experience to date. My word is connected. Limitless. I would say growth. Thank you. Now, as we go to take questions, in case you're wondering, is MIT Sloan right for me? This is the class profile. This is combined. The 408 is combined MBA and LGO of those who matriculated last year. So two of these people are actually in this number here. So on average, five years of experience, we have 63 different countries represented. That is amazing. Um, you know, I, I, I understand why we put on things like GPA. Um, I want people to understand, though, that these are you know, averages, these are medians. We take a very comprehensive look um, at our applicants. I will say though, that fundamentally when all is said and done, we're asking ourselves three questions. The first is, can he or she do, be successful in an MIT Sloan classroom? There's multiple ways to demonstrate that, of which GPA is only one piece of that. You know, you have the GMAT or GRE, you have your GPA, you might have a, a graduate degree, you might have done other certifications, your current work situation might actually lend itself to be supportive. So there are many ways. The second the thing that we're really looking for is evidence of your desire, willingness to make an impact, make a difference, make a contribution. We only have 408 seats to fill. That's not a lot. We want to make sure that every single seat, and as you can see here, we did pretty well with these three, are people who want to make a difference, who want to contribute. And then the third is really around people skills. I think throughout the course of this conversation, the last hour or so, you have seen just how much uh, students work with one another and support one another. And we want to ensure that everyone really is comfortable and enjoys being in a team environment. With that, what about if we take a couple of questions from here? I won't be offended if they're all directed at them. Um, and then David also, you'll give us some questions from people who are on the live stream as well. Who wants to go, ooh, look at that, really fast. So I happen to know that my friend here traveled very far to get here. So I'm gonna give you the first. Uh, so question to the panelists though. Um, <laughs> I took down some notes of the activities you took. Uh, there's a lot of stuff in there. You even met your co-founder during the activities you took, the integrated community classes. Uh, one thing I even remember, I didn't write it down. So I can bet it, you said doing everything all at once. So the question, it's two questions. Maybe you can answer one, maybe you can answer both. How did you manage the FOMO that you mentioned or even counteracted the fear of uh, missing out on joy? And I know the answer potentially is going to be, well, I had a clear goal. I set goals for myself when I applied to business school. So if that's the answer, how did and did your goal evolve as you went through business school? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, you have to so you have to set realistic goals as to what it is that you want to accomplish but you also have to be very flexible realizing that your goals will change once you get here you it's like the iceberg problem you think you know what you're getting into and then once you get here you realize there's a lot more to the iceberg and that's a good thing because that means a lot more opportunities a lot more people from a lot more different places your interest might be peaked uh, from the FOMO perspective, as a, we every first year is told this, no one listens, and then they become second year, and then they pass on the advice of the first years, and it continues cycle. At the end of the day, what you simply have to do is embark on the journey. Be aware that you're only going to be a first year once, and it's it's okay if you end up going to all those activities because of FOMO, because that's what's going to give you the wisdom for as a second year to then develop JOMO, which is the joy of missing out. <laughs> And the thing is, is like, if that doesn't happen first year, it might not happen the, the Jomo second year. So the advice I can tell you is like, embrace it. The fact that you might have that, embark on that journey and then be flexible to your goals changing and being amenable. Um, that's the best way I can answer that question. Anything else? I'll add one more piece. I think that was a really good answer. Um, I've also learned much better than I ever have in my life before how to reflect. Um, even on, on small moments um, and, and use that to change 
my goals as I go along. So I do have some kind of overarching driving goals, but like small decisions I'm making day to day are much more informed than they were before on my ability to kind of reflect real time. Um, and I will, on a second note, also comment on what Donna mentioned that this is a fairly small MBA class compared to other schools. And that's a big benefit too, because you can kind of like have a sense of what all the things are and kind of know the people and know when the thing tonight will happen similarly next month. And you can, you know, pass on it tonight because you have something else to do. Um, so you can, that's why I said I felt connected. Okay, next question. Yes. Great. Uh, thank you guys for doing this. I'm Ben Cat. I'm in the cybersecurity space and entrepreneurship is the route that I want to take. So I guess my question is to pull up this So as a as an entrepreneur now um, and aspiring entrepreneur when he was there, was there any specific course or anything in particular, like a field trip or something that you would recommend to a potential student? Can you just repeat the question so that? So the way I understood the question is like, what are the resources within the community that I took advantage of in order to help me in my entrepreneurship journey, field trip classes and clubs and so on. So my, what I'm about to tell you is specifically in the energy and climate club, because that's what I was involved in, but I very quickly dove into that community and ecosystem within MIT, not just Sloan, MIT. So I joined the MIT energy and climate club. And we host the largest student-led conference in the world, the MIT Energy Conference in April, where I got to meet a lot of cool and exciting people. There were a lot of entrepreneurial opportunities that came from that, just none that attracted my interest or where, where I saw I fit. I took the classes where I met my co-founder was in the MIT Climate and Energy class, Ventures class, where the whole purpose is to commercialize technology out of the MIT labs into the real world. Now, those are two examples, but every other ecosystem has an equivalent for both the club, the conference, and the class, healthcare, sustainability. Uh, so you just simply have to dive in in order to be able to meet those people and get those opportunities. Um, and then the one other thing I'll mention that's regardless of which ecosystem or which uh, industry you're interested in, the Martin Trust Center. The Martin Trust Center is a center of entrepreneurship at MIT. And if you ever just want to be inspired and learn the fundamentals that can be applied to any single industry, you go there and you will meet people from all over the place. And you'll be surprised how one, transferable skills can be from different industry. Two, how much your interest is going to be peaked in other directions as you get to explore that. Because the thing is, you might be really interested in cybersecurity, but how do you know there's not a cross intersection of cybersecurity with a different field where you can bring that expertise, collaborate with someone else and come up with something even greater? David, do we have a question online? Yes, uh, so for the panelists, um, what do you wish you knew about MIT Sloan before you decided to come here? <laughs> Um, so the other word I was going to say was humility, um, and that's because nothing will humble you than being in a classroom with MIT students, um, and that's because the wealth of knowledge, the experience, um, the sheer like excellence will blow your mind, and and I say that in in like just loving my core teammates. By the way, core teammates are um, a group of students that MIT assigns you with based on uh, characteristics, uh, background uh, that they deem are fitting to all of us. It's between like five to six people. You get to work with them the entire semester on all subjects um, and submissions. And I just, I'm always humbled by the um, amount of students that are just amazing. We have NASA scientists, we have um, engineers, we have people working on incredible um, entrepreneurship ventures. And it's just, it's really amazing. And you get to come into this place, not just with Sloan students, but within the MIT ecosystem. And it's humbling to know that you get to exist as one of these students. Um, and I just, I'm love, I love that. I'm always humbled by that experience. And um, yeah, that's one thing I wish I knew because it definitely humbled me because I bet all of you sitting in this room are the big sharks in your industry, in your space. That will not be the case when you come to Sloan because everybody will be excellent and will be striving for the best. So that's definitely an experience. And the best part is that everyone feels the same way. Yeah. But the one I would add, one thing that is really great about Sloan is that there's this uh, saying, we have something called Sloanies helping Sloanies. And when people tell you that, you think it's a marketing scheme. It's really not. Uh, people, 
the students, your classmates, because it is embedded in our mission, um, people help you, students help you. If you want a case with them for consulting IB, they'll sit right there with you on Zoom or in person doing two to three hour cases with you. And it's just that place that fosters inclusivity and community. And I love that. And I highly, highly encourage people to take advantage of it. Another question in the room? Sure. Um, so I've been on the fence a little bit on going to an MBA program. So I was thinking like, what's like a priceless component to the program here at, MB, at MIT that you don't think you could have gotten anywhere else? I can take a bit on that one. My answer is a little unique, I'll do it. So for me, what was priceless was the boundless connections that I've made. And not just with the students, but because of the program and because I've met classmates are from all over the world, I've gotten the privilege to be able to travel to this, those different places and be able to connect with individuals from all over the world. Uh, to the core team experience, uh, my core team, including me, was six people. I was a Dominican engineer. We had a someone from Turkey, Olympic sailor consultant for New Zealand who had a JD, but never used it. Uh, HR, uh, she was from Armenia. We had an economic consultant from Chicago, and then we have a, a finance, uh, finance, finance person from Saudi Arabia. That right there was, in my opinion, one of the most diverse teams that you can ever have in any way, shape, or form. And all of them helped me connect some other part of the world. And through that, I just kept expanding my knowledge about the world, not only in the industries and fields, but also in the cultures. Uh, I was able to go to different places, but also get to experience different cultures, whether it's through dinners, uh, whether it's through like club events, through parties and celebrations and stuff like that. And I used to work at a large global oil and gas company when I started my career. And even then, I never experienced this much diversity. And it's something that I truly do believe has prepared me to be a better world class leader, because I am now better prepared to communicate, collaborate, work with different cultures. And it's something you can definitely develop in the real world, but I think it's impossible to get the same breadth and depth of diversity in two years compared to you trying to accomplish that in the world. And that's something that I will consider priceless because it will help me for the rest of my life. I'll echo what Stuart's saying. I think for me, the priceless piece of all of this is the opportunity and the time to explore. There's rarely a time in your life to invest in yourself in this way, to explore cultures and people that you never would have met and been put in a situation together with, um, but also industries, opportunities, just explore things beyond what you would have. I remember my first day meeting my LGO cohort um, and like a quarter of the room was super serious that they were going to help solve climate change. And I came from a healthcare background. It's like, I want to do healthcare technology. This is what I'm going to do. But I was I care about the climate too. And I was so inspired and I was like, Hey, maybe, you know, like this is a, a time and a moment where I, I might think about a different career path, a different um, piece of my career and my story and my life. And I also am now like so grateful that those people are in my orbit. And if I had stayed in my career at my company um, or, you know, moved to a different company in the same industry, I, I wouldn't have had those people and that experience in that moment. David, one more online, and then we're going to do one more here, and then we'll break for a little bit of networking. I see people getting a little <laughs> Go ahead. Okay, uh, if you were to choose, who is the one person that gave you the most in inspiration in your MIT journey so far? <laughs> <laughs> There's so many options. <laughs> That's a really good one. Well, it could be family members. Like, we'll get back on focus. One person here. who's been most influential in your MIT journey. Yes. A boss, a mentor. Wow. I. <laughs> I. Um, this is not mutually exclusive, but I, I would lean on my core teammates. Um, and we talked about the incredible opportunity to work with such a diverse set of individuals from around the world. And that's something that's super unique to MIT Sloan. And we all joke around that it's, you know, it's it's sometimes pretty traumatic to work with so many people who have different conflicting priorities, conflicting interests, but 
there's so much beauty that comes out of working with people with the same people for four to five months on the same project. Um, and when I tell you we went through the highs and the really lows together, it, we really did. And those are the people you always go back to, um, to cry to, to ask advice, to seek, um, ad, uh, you know, recruiting opportunities from. It's it's one of those things that I really treasure treasure out of my uh, Sloan experience. And you talked about the point of reflection um, at Sloan that's truly embedded in the curriculum when you're doing core semester. Um, as part of the communications class, we have to meet once a week with our teammates and an advisor to really talk about what's happening through our core experience. Um, how do we communicate with each other? How do we effectively communicate with each other? How do you talk about your feelings? Some things that people just may not be naturally good at. This is a safe and open space where nothing comes out of that room. And that's those are the people I often go back to and 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 have conversation. I was talking to my core teammate last night who's interning at Goldman Sachs and he's up till 2 a.m. and working and we're commiserating about, you know, internship and recruiting and we're open and vulnerable. And these are the beautiful experiences that you get to have with people that you met a year ago. So those are the people I lean on. Um, I've had a lot of connections that have impacted, shaped the course of my career, uh, my time here at Sloan. One that I'll mention from the earlier side was another professor, Professor Mero. Uh, he's a communications professor. So that's one of your core classes that you take is communica communications for leader. And the reason I am bringing him up right now is because he single-handedly convinced me, not convinced me, made me notice that I wanted to become a world-class communicator. What does that mean? It can be very broad, but I want to be an individual that not only creates change through my startup or my own work, but I want to also inspire hope. And he, I always thought that it was going to be too difficult uh, to get to that point. And after going through the class with him, I remember in my feedback survey, survey back to him, I wrote out basically a whole essay thanking him because because of him, I now saw a path forward towards becoming a world-class communicator that could inspire anyone and everyone to be the best version of themselves. Because that's what he did to me as, as a student. Um, after graduation, uh, we were talking, he congratulated me and I told him that don't be too surprised if I come back to you, whether it's in a few years or in a decade, uh, just so, so I can learn more about your path. Uh, because a professor might be in the future if I succeed in some other goals so I can inspire some other future business students to accomplish similar goals. Since we've covered core team and professor, <laughs> professors, I'll bring in a Sloan term, SOs, so they're significant others. So my partner has probably been most influential for me. Um, I think a lot of people have other people in their lives that they're thinking about moving to Boston with, um, engaging in a school experience that your partner is not directly involved in. This has been the most wonderful experience. He knows all the people, knows all the things I'm doing, is in many of the WhatsApp chats, sometimes more of them, monitors them for me um, to help with the <laughs> prioritization sometimes. Um, but it, he, he has uh, really been instrumental in helping me do a lot of that processing and, and debriefing. Okay, one last question from this audience, then I have a very short video. Oh my God, I don't know who to pick. Oh, you said to pick him? Okay. <laughs> All right, go ahead. Thank you for allowing me to have kind of a final question of the evening from- Pressure, it better be a good one. <laughs> I hope so. Um, I know the MBA experience is touted as being transformative and um, can be unique to each person in terms of just their experience. Um, I know Lily spoke about growth, I think from each panelist, I wanted to kind of hear, what would you say are the top two skills, uh, whether it be kind of uh, soft skills or leadership skills that you have kind of either added or amplified during your time period here? And um, examples of like when you kind of thought they came to fruition. So the questions are uh, what skills, you want two from each of them. See, this is how we get to six hours <laughs> uh, that they have either elevated or that they've actually acquired since coming to Sloan. I'll give you two quickly because I know we're going to break, but I mentioned reflection and then the second one would be active listening. Ooh, that's a good one. <laughs> um, the first one for me was humility. Um, I've definitely become a lot more humble since coming to Sloan, like Lily mentioned. Uh, and the second one, I just talked about it was communication, getting to the next step. 
Um, my first one would be prioritization. Um, it's it's something that you completely have to, you get better at it as you experience more of your MBA experience and all the courses and the curriculums. Uh, you got to do what's best for you. Uh, it's two years, make the most out of it. So prioritization. And then second would be effective communication. Uh, there's so many resources that you can take and leverage communicating with data. Professor Arthi, one of the best classes at Sloan. Um, it, it basically embeds um, the opportunity to use data and how you can leverage a presentation if you're doing consulting or any other career. So effective communication and prioritization would be my two skill sets.